Hey, good to see everybody tonight. Revelation 1, we're getting to text tonight. Our first two classes, we looked at some introductory material. Tonight, we will actually read text. And so we'll ask you to open Revelation chapter 1, and we'll do that in just a minute. Great to see everybody this afternoon. If you're visiting with us, welcome. This quarter in this class, we are taking a look at the book of Revelation, trying to take a big picture look, uh, not get bogged down in the minutia, but see the big picture and get the messages that are, that are there. Glad you're with us tonight. Super Bowl Sunday. You know, I was thinking today that uh, when we were in the old building, back when everybody had two services on Sunday, a lot of churches now just meet in the morning, but everybody had two services. We were the first church in Tampa Bay that moved their services from 6 o'clock to 5 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. And so on Super Bowl Sunday, we had a building full of visitors. <clears throat> Wonder why. Wonder why that was, yeah. All right, how many of you have Kansas City tonight? Hold them high. Wow. How many of you have Philly? How many of you don't care? That is just wrong. That is just completely wrong. My, oh, you know, part of the entrance exam getting into heaven, you're going to have to know who won tonight. So, oh, man. Well, it's good to see you. Glad we can study the, together as we uh, continue our trek through the book of Revelation. And really happy that tonight we can get we can begin to look at text. Let's uh, bow our heads, let's pray together, and then we'll get down to business tonight. Well, good Father, what a wonderful Lord's Day you've blessed us with. A tremendous morning of worship today that we pray was acceptable in every way. The privilege of seeing Joshua baptized this morning, and now the privilege of studying the Bible together. Thank you, dear God, for the revelation. Thank you for this amazing book, for what you allowed John to see. And we pray, Holy God, that as we study tonight and as we're introduced to your son Jesus, because this is, after all, the revelation of Jesus Christ, we pray, Holy God, that we'll have good insight into your son, that we will see him more clearly than perhaps we have in the past, that we will honor and respect him more than perhaps we have in the past, and that we will place our faith and hope and trust in him more than perhaps we have in the past. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Please be with all who in our building meet tonight. And thank you for our time together and the fellowship we enjoy. We pray to you in Jesus' name, and amen. Well, you know, when we were together last, we talked about the fact that <clears throat> the revelation can be confusing, and we said it can be controversial, but we said that it is well worth the effort to understand. I was thinking about that and thinking about how would you illustrate that, you know, and I, and I thought about the fact that, you know, I wonder how many, how many families, <clears throat> when they go to a family reunion, they've got a... They've got an odd relative. I mean, they've got, a, they've got an, odd, an odd aunt or uncle, or they've got an odd cousin. I mean, if you're, if you're thinking about that, and you're thinking about when you went to a family reunion, you're thinking to yourself, well, no, I, you know, I, we just really don't have anybody like that in our family. It may be you. It, just, it may be you. The book of Revelation is kind of that odd relative in the family. It's there. It's really important. But um, people tend to avoid it. And we've talked about already that we really, we really don't need to do that at all. I want to give you something that's not on your sheet, but I, I'll, I was thinking about that this week. The book of Revelation isn't going to say anything that you can't find elsewhere in the Bible. It's just going to say it in a different way. I got to thinking about that this week. I think that's a true statement. <clears throat> that, that the book of Revelation really doesn't say anything you can't read elsewhere. But it says it in a very, very different way. It says it in a way that is designed to communicate, designed to communicate to the eye and the heart. And so I, maybe that will help us a little bit as we kind of work our way through this. The entirety of the Bible is a revelation of Jesus Christ, isn't it? I mean, everything before the New Testament is pointing to Jesus, right? Everything from the prophets, they, they point to Jesus. The entire Bible <clears throat> is designed to lead us to an understanding an understanding of Jesus, and, and faith, faith in Jesus. The last book of the Bible, the Revelation, makes that the absolute, the absolute focus. And so in my Bible, as in yours, the title is The Revelation of Jesus Christ. And if you look at verse, well, let me back up from that. <clears throat> if you look at verse 1, take a look in your, in your text at how this begins. <clears throat> revelation 1 1 the revelation of jesus christ which god gave to him to show his servants things which must shortly take place the revelation of jesus christ those are the first words of this book 
And if you're taking notes, <clears throat> you might want to jot down that it's just saying that he is the content of the book. He is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he is the agent of the revelation. It is a revelation that he gives. And so he is both. He's the content of the book, and he is the agent through which the book is delivered. Now, the book of Revelation really is an interesting book. It's unlike <clears throat> others for a variety of reasons. It is an epistle. It's an epistle. What's, what's our word for epistle? Pardon me? What's our word for epistles? Letters. And so what, where are the letters in the Revelation? Where are they? Chapters where? you got to speak up in here. <clears throat> Sound doesn't travel in this room unless you have a microphone. Revelation 2 and 3, that's right. And so you've got seven letters. And so this, this book is an epistle. It has letters. It has seven letters in it. But it's also an apocalypse. It is a revelation. And so <clears throat> it begins at the very beginning and says, this is a message which God sent and signified through his servant John. And it means that he used signs and symbols. And he did that through the hand of John. And what John saw and what John saw, God told him to write. And so it is an apocalypse. It's going to use language. It is unlike other language in the Bible. There are visions with signs and symbols to teach of God's care in difficult times. And then third, it's a prophecy. It's a prophecy. And so four times John will call what he writes <clears throat> prophecy. There are two kinds, when you read the word pro prophecy, when we talk about prophecy, there are two kinds of prophecy, right? We usually think of prophecy, and we think about prophecy telling what? The future. the future. That's the way we usually think of it, right? And so we talk about predictive prophecy. But there's prophecies used in another way. What, what's the other way that it's used? Revealing. Revealing. That's right. And so there's predictive prophecy, and there's teaching prophecy. There's predictive prophecy, and there's teaching prophecy. And so in Revelation 1 and 3, the text says, Blessed is the one who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. How do you keep, how do you obey predictive prophecy? Well, you can't. You can't because it's predictive. It's of the future. It's not yet. But you can obey revealing prophecy, teaching prophecy. And so even in the New Testament, <clears throat> we will find, for example, where God gave some to be prophets and and the word would be used simply to mean he gave teachers or he gave preachers. He gave those who would instruct in the, in the word. And so this book is just amazing because it's an epistle, it's letters, it's apocalypse, it has signs and symbols and visions and imagery, and it's prophecy, both teaching prophecy and predictive prophecy. And so it's an amazing book along that line. I don't know of any other book in the 66 that is exactly like that. It's really important to understand. The book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is not designed to help you make a chart tracking the end of time. A lot of people read the book that way. They want to, they want to, they want to plot out <clears throat> and they want, to, they want to say, well, the book of Revelation is trying to help me chart the end of time. That's not, that's not it. It's not designed to help you chart the end of time. It's designed to help you make choices. It's not charting, it's choices. The book of Revelation is designed to help you make choices as to how to live right now. All right? So let's read a little bit. you have your Bible tonight? Let's read the first <clears throat> a good bit of the first chapter together. And then we'll just kind of wind our way through the big picture that chapter 1 provides us of this image of Jesus. All right? So let's read a little bit. Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave to him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. He sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Angels, of course, in this book are going to be seen everywhere, and we'll take some time and talk about angels a little bit because we don't talk about them nearly enough. Verse 2, <clears throat> John bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to everything that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads those uh, and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things that are written in it for the time is near. Here's how it begins in verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. When you read about God being is and was and is to come, what's it saying about God? What's our word for that? You got to speak up. I can't hear you in here unless you speak up. It's eternal. That's right. He is eternal. So he is an eternal God. And so grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. 
and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and made us, made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And amen. And so in the first, in the first six verses, we're introduced to the Father and to the Spirit and to the Son. And we're told something about all three of them. And we'll come back to that in just a second. Verse 7, Behold, the Lord is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. They who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Now, now the Lord speaks. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Verse 9, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patient endurance of Jesus Christ, I was on the island that is called Patmos because of the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was on the, in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, and the Lord speaks again here, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book, send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And John says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun, shining in its strength. And when I saw him, look at this, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the one who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death, and so write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. The mystery, by the way, of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw. They are, they are the seven <clears throat> churches. Let's stop there with the reading of that first chapter. The book of Revelation is one of the few books in the Bible that has a true and genuine introduction. And the first chapter is, in fact, that. It is a true and genuine introduction to the book. And again, it begins with verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the true title of the book, the revelation that was given by Jesus Christ and the revelation of Jesus Christ. His present glory, His rule, His victory, the victory of His cause. I want you to look with me again at verses 4 and 5. It's extremely important. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from Him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who were before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful, the faithful witness. And so again, we've got an introduction to the Father and to the Spirit <clears throat> and of Jesus. And so let's talk about that for, for just a second here. We've got the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Son. And so of the Father it is said, Him who is, and who was, and who is to come. So we said a moment ago, when you see those words about the Father, the Holy Spirit, or Jesus, again, what are they saying about Him? That He's eternal. That is eternal. Without, Isaiah said, without beginning of years or end of days, right? <clears throat> and so that, that simply speaks to His nature. When God spoke to Moses out of the bush that was not consumed by the fire, Moses said, they're going to ask me, who sent you? And he said, what shall I say to them? And how did God respond? What did he say? I am. I am. Tell them that I am has sent you. Now we've talked about that in Bible classes. We've talked about that in sermon. That I am. And it's interesting that God went on and he said, by the way, this is my covenant name. And I give this name to you to use forever. And then we've talked about this. What did the Jews immediately stop doing? using his name. And so he said, I'm giving you this name. I want you to use it forever. And they stopped using it. Well, they stopped using it for a noble, noble reason. What was the reason? 
It's too holy. Too holy to use. We might, we might misuse it. So <clears throat> the upshot of that, though, is that we don't know exactly how that was pronounced. Because all we have for I am are four consonants. So we've got Y-H-W-H. That's all we have. And so we don't know how to pronounce that. So later, the Jews began to add some vowels from words like Adoniah, which means Lord. And so they would add some of the vowels there. And so in the older translations of our Bible, we have the word Jehovah, right? Almost all modern scholarship now uses the word Yahweh. But it's, it's this idea that God is I am. And I am, again, says he is without beginning of years or end of days. And that's what the Revelation is saying. But our English Bibles don't always, don't always make clear what the language is saying. John is extremely emphatic about this. And so in the, in the Greek in which he was writing, it literally is him who the is and who the was and who the is to come. And so in the language, the original language, there is that definite article there. <clears throat> and it's just, it's just a way of emphasizing what is being said about him. It's the same thing, by the way, in Matthew 16 and 18 when Jesus said, um, uh, or Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Literally it is, you are the Christ, the Son, the living, the God. And when they put the definite article in front of those words, it was their way of emphasizing that. And that's what you have here. And so the introduction is that this is the Father who is eternal. And John goes out of his way to make <clears throat> that point. And then we've got this business of the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits who are before his throne. Now Jesus and the apostles, they always speak of the Holy Spirit singular, right? There is one Holy Spirit. But clearly the Holy Spirit's under consideration here. But we've already said that in the Revelation, numbers mean something, right? And so the number seven, the most important number in the book, it means what? Complete. Complete. Perfection. Whole. It means wholeness, right? And so this is the idea that this, <clears throat> it is one spirit, but he is referred to here in, in this, this way, this seven spirits. Un undoubtedly a reference to his perfection, his completeness, and the universality of his work. And then we've got third, Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. He is the faithful witness. If he is a faithful, what does a faithful witness do? Even today, a faithful witness will do what? He will tell the truth. He will tell the truth. And that's what's being said about Jesus here. Now it's said in other places in the New Testament. For example, to the Corinthians, all the promises of God in Jesus Christ are yes, and in Him, all the promises are amen. In other words, whatever Jesus says, you can take it to the bank because He is absolutely true. He is a true, faithful witness. And so at the beginning of the book, we're introduced to the Father, who is eternal, to the Holy Spirit, who is complete, who is perfect and universal in His work, and to Jesus Christ, who always tells the truth. And so at the very beginning, I mean, we've just got these verses that are just full, just, just pregnant with meaning. And so that, that's so important. And then <clears throat> I want us to talk just a minute about verse 9, where John talks about himself. So he talks about Father, Son, and Spirit. But then in verse 9, John talks about himself. And he says, I, John, am both your brother and companion in tribulation and the kingdom and patience or the endurance of Jesus Christ and he said, I was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and because of my testimony about the word of God regarding Jesus Christ. There are four words in that verse that are really important. And so if you're taking notes, let's just kind of take note of them because he's introduced us to Father, Son, and Spirit, but now he tells us something about himself. The first is, <clears throat> the first is that he's a companion in the kingdom of God. And he says, I'm with you. We're both in the kingdom of God. Kingdom is a really important concept in the Bible. You know that. You're good Bible students. The word kingdom is used in four very distinct senses in the Bible. The earliest and first use of kingdom is God's universal reign. And so the psalmist would talk about that he is a great king over all the, all the earth. And he's talking about his creation. And so God's universal reign over all of his creation. The second way kingdom is used <clears throat> in the Bible is is Israel, the Hebrew nation. 
And God made them a kingdom unto himself. And so you've got God's universal reign over all of creation. And then secondly, you've got Israel, the Hebrew nation. They were a kingdom to him. The third way kingdom is used is the way that we think about it the most, and that is the kingdom of Christ, what we are a part of. We have been transferred, what did Paul say, out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of his love. And so we're part of the kingdom of God now, the reign and rule of God in our hearts. And then the fourth way kingdom is used <clears throat> is the everlasting kingdom of heaven. That's the way Peter used it in 2 Peter 1. So, you know, if these virtues, the, the virtues, the seven virtues, if these things are in you and abound, you'll neither be blind nor unfruitful. And he says, and so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of God. And so the word kingdom is used in those four ways. John is using it to talk about the kingdom that you or I are part of. And he says, the reason, this, the reason what I'm about to write should have relevance to you is that we're in this together. We're all in the kingdom together. But the second word in that verse that's important is the word tribulation. Because he says, right now, my situation is not good. Because my situation right now is tribulation. And tribulation is a word that's going to get a lot of play in the book of Revelation. There's tribulation, and then it also talks about great tribulation. Tribulation, we said last week, has to do with a pressing together. When something is, is trodden upon, it is pressed. I used the illustration last week that um, I always think about something within the jaws of a vice, and someone's out there on the end and they're cranking that down, and you're being pressed and squeezed in that. That would have been the word for tribulation. Everybody in the first century got it. We don't use that word much. Everybody in the first century would have understood exactly what tribulation is. It is being pressured. It is being squeezed, pressed, trodden down, put in the jaws of a vice. And John says, that's where I am. That's what's going on. But again, what does he say? I'm your brother and companion in this. I'm going through this just like you are. Now here's the third word. <clears throat> Ah, well, let me look at that. Jesus used that as well. John 16, The things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace, in the world you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. But in the world, everybody gets a little tribulation. Nobody gets out of this world without some tribulation from time to time. Just, it just doesn't, just doesn't happen. All right. And then Patmos. He says, I'm on the Isle of Patmos. And Patmos was just a penal colony. And it was kind of a, it was a five, <clears throat> five, miles long, one mile wide island out in the middle of the, of the Aegean here. I'll show you another picture of it. And then let me show you where it is. You can see where it is. So there are the, there are the seven churches, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Smyrna, Ephesus, Philadelphia, Laodicea. And you can see where Patmos is. It's just off the, just off the coastline there. And it was, it was just a penal colony. He was there to be punished. And he was there, <clears throat> he says, because of the testimony of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm here because I've been preaching about Jesus Christ. You have to wonder how many times from Acts 4, in Acts 4 the apostles are brought before the council and they beat them and they say, from now on you can't do what they tell them, you can't do this anymore. What'd they say? Yes, sir, you can't preach. You can't preach about Jesus anymore. And then they beat them and let them go. And so they left and what'd they do? Well, they just immediately started preaching everywhere. And it got them in trouble. It got them in trouble. By this point in time, John almost certainly is the last living apostle. We've got a lot of tradition about how the other 11 died, but that's all it is, is tradition. Maybe, maybe true, maybe not. <clears throat> but they died because they wouldn't stop. They wouldn't stop preaching. I mean, all of them died because they wouldn't stop preaching. And so John says, this is, this is why I'm here. And so those four words, <clears throat> those four words in verse 9, uh, are really, really important. You have your Bible? Read with me in verse 10. Look with me at verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as though <clears throat> it were a trumpet. Just, just a couple of thoughts here real quick, and then we're going to get really where we're going tonight. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. We understand Lord's day. What day is that for us? That's today. That's today. There's another phrase in the Bible that sounds like Lord's Day, 
but it has a completely different meaning, what would that be? Not Lord's Day, but reverse some words there. Day of the Lord. Are they the same, Ron? No. What's the difference? What's the day of the Lord? That's Judgment Day. That's right. <clears throat> so don't confuse the two. We're going to read about both in the book, but they are, not, they are not one in the same. And it's interesting that what you find John doing on the Lord's Day is what we do on the Lord's Day 2,000 years later. He was worshiping, and that's what we do, because that doesn't change. And it's interesting in verse 10, this is one more thing, we just need, we're just kind of laying a little groundwork here. I heard a voice behind me, a loud voice, as a trumpet. And trumpets are going to be really, really important in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> and they are loud, they are clear, they are distinct, they are used to get your attention, fanfare, and announcement. And so, the book of Revelation begins, the revelation of Jesus Christ, and almost from the beginning it says, look, if you're going to get the big picture of this book, you got to get the picture of a big Jesus. And so that's what he does in the rest of chapter 1. All right, well that took longer than I thought. So we're going to get quickly through what I want to talk about. I want to tell you three things out of Revelation 1 about Jesus. Number one, he rules over the church. He rules over <clears throat> the church. Jesus rules over the church. Why? What's the most obvious answer to that? Because it's his. He rules over it because it belongs to him. When we talk about being a church of Christ, what we are saying is not, we're not, it's not a title on a sign. It is a statement of ownership. We understand that we belong, we belong to him. Let's take a look at some verses here. Verses 12 and 13, John said, I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of seven lampstands, there was one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden golden band. I want you also to read with me. It's not on the screen. Look in your Bible at verse 20. Look at verse 20, where Jesus says, by the way, let me explain to you, John, what you just saw. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The stars are the angel of the seven churches. But here's for our purpose what we need to see. The seven lampstands which you saw, they are, <clears throat> they are the seven churches. They are the seven churches, right? So the lampstands are churches. And again, there are seven of them. And we talked about this a minute ago. Words, numbers have meaning in the book of Revelation. Seven means what? Complete, Complete or perfection. So <clears throat> when John, when, when Jesus says, look, I'm writing to these seven churches, he's saying, I'm going to write messages to these seven churches that are for all churches for all time. The message that we're going to read in the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3 are just as applicable in 2023 as they were at the end of the first century. Because Jesus says they are. It's not, we said this in the introduction, it's not just that there were just seven churches in Asia Minor, because there were a lot more, obviously. But he chooses these sevens, and he writes seven messages. And, and it's almost as if he's saying, look, these are seven messages that churches are going to need from now on. And that's why we said we're going, to take, we're going to take a few weeks to deal with the seven churches. Yeah, typically, they get passed over pretty quickly. But this book is written to those seven churches. And so it only makes sense to me that we take a little bit of time and think about what Jesus said was so important <clears throat> that, that these seven churches needed it, and we need it. We need it still today. It's interesting that there are seven lampstands, seven lampstands, and then Jesus is depicted as being in the midst. We don't talk about midst. We don't say he's in the midst of them. What word do we use? Middle. middle. We say he's in the middle of that. And so Jesus is in the middle of his churches. He's in the midst of his churches. What's that saying about Jesus? He's in the middle of his churches. What's it saying about him? I think it's saying that he knows what's going on. He's there. He's in the middle of his churches. He knew what was going on at Ephesus. That's why he knew what to write them, right? And so to all seven of the churches, he uses a little two-word phrase with all, all seven of them. Anybody remember what it was? I know. I know. 
Well, how did he know? Because he's in the midst of it. How does he know what's going on in Temple Terrace? Because he's in the midst of us. We need to remember that. <laughs> we need to remember that. That we're not operating just in isolation out here. That the Lord is in the midst of us. He understands and he knows. <clears throat> he knows what's going on. It, and it's interesting, let me just make a quick point here. There are seven lampstands which represent the seven churches. So if there are seven lampstands, there's not just one lampstand with seven prongs, right? It's not a menorah. There are seven lampstands. What's that saying about the churches? Pardon me? Yeah, there's our word. It's saying that they are independent and that they are autonomous. They are independent and they are autonomous. But they are bound together. If you have seven lampstands that are producing light, they are independent and autonomous. But what unites them? What binds them together? The light, right? The light joins together. You can't tell where the light ends with one church and begins in another. The light is the light <clears throat> that joins that joins them together, the light that they produce, and the common source of that light, which is Jesus, of course. And the point of that is that, that, that Jesus is the ruler of, of his church, the ruler of, of, of the church. In verse 15, his voice is the sound of many waters. And, and the point of that is that's the voice we've got to listen to because he has the dominant voice. Have you ever stood, <clears throat> have you ever stood, any, anybody here been to Niagara Falls? Anybody in this room? A few of you have, yeah. And so if you're at Niagara Falls and you're out on that, the mist of the sea and you're in that boat down there, can you shout down Niagara Falls? You, you cannot. Have you ever been to, you know, I grew up next to the Pacific Ocean. And uh, the Pacific is not, like, is not like the Gulf of Mexico. It's not like a bay. I mean, there are crashing waves that do not stop. And when you're walking by, you... You can't, you can't outshout the ocean, the waters. And so his voice was the sound of many waters. And the point he's making is that that's the voice we've got to listen to. The church belongs to him. He rules over his church. And so the voice that we have to listen to is his. And when we try to shout him down, we try to speak over him, we're doing something it's impossible to do. I mean, we might be distracted. We might distract others. But the fact of the matter is that his, <clears throat> his voice has the has the final has the final word and then secondly he rules over he rules over our life not just the church but he rules over our life look at verse 16 with me he had in his hand <clears throat> seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp a sharp two-edged sword there's a lot been made of that and obviously there's a similar reference in the book of hebrews right that that the word of god is is sharp as a two-edged sword and so Clearly, there's, there's some tie there. But I think, I think this makes us ask two questions. The first question is this. Whose words carry the most weight in your life? Whose words <clears throat> carry the most weight in your life? I said this in a sermon three or four months ago. That I think all of us from time to time need to ask ourselves, what are the voices that we allow have authority in our life now for some people that's the voice of a political party for some it's the voice of a certain news outlet for some it's the voice of maybe a mom and dad for some, and, and that list can just go on and on and on but we all need to ask ourselves what is the voice that we allow to have authority in our life because the revelation says pretty clearly. If you're going to call yourself a Christian, a Christian, a Christ follower, then he gets to have the authority in your life, right? And so the second application of that is not just <clears throat> whose words carry the most weight in your life, but secondly, whose words carry the most weight in the church. And that's important because again, he rules over his church because it belongs to him. And out of his mouth, goes this sharp two-edged sword, which is clearly a reference for his word. And we have to decide whether or not he gets, he gets the final say. So whose words carry the most weight in the church? 
There have been a lot of answers to that through the, through the years, by the way. Sometimes it's the individual with the most money. Sometimes it's the squeaky wheel that gets the grease, the one who complains the most. Uh, maybe it's the culture sometimes that says, you know, if you're not politically correct, uh, we're going to have to pay a price for that. Sometimes the government, you know, that says, look, you're going to do what we want or we'll punish you in some way. And uh, so that, that goes on and on and on. But the big picture of Jesus says that he doesn't exist to please us. The church exists to please him. We need, we need to remember that. Now, I've got to tell you that those two observations, it seems to me, are good news. And it's good news because it means that Jesus alone decides the destiny of the church. The church belongs to him. And he has the final authoritative word. That's why, listen to me carefully, ladies and gentlemen, that's why that the empires of men cannot exterminate the church of the Lord. And it's also why they should not intimidate the church of the Lord. i got to tell you, when I read the Revelation and know what was going on among those Christians in the first century and the ways that they were suffering for their faith, I, I wonder how we would do with that. I mean, I wonder how I would do with that. We just need, it just honesty compels me to wonder, how would I do with that? Because it's easy to read about this. It's easy to talk about it. It's easy to read the history about it. But to think if I were actually living that. You know, I've, I've used the illustration before. What, what would it be like if when you got home tonight, what would it be like if when you got home tonight and <clears throat> you settled down to watch the Super Bowl and there's a bang at your door, not a knock, they don't ring the bell, there's a, a pounding on your door, and you open it, and there are armed soldiers there. And they tell you, they say, you've got 10 minutes, you've got 10 minutes, gather whatever it is that you can carry, whatever you want to take, but it's only as much as you can carry, and in 10 minutes you're leaving this house, and you will never be here again. You will never see this house again. What would that be like? And then they would say to you, unless, unless you'd like to renounce your faith in Jesus. Now you just renounce your faith in Jesus and we'll leave and you can go back in and watch Super Bowl and be with your family. Choice is yours. Countless Christians faced that in the first century. Some variation of that over and over and over again. And so at the very beginning of this book, when John is going to talk to people who've been going through that and who had made the choice, chapter 6, to be sacrificed on the altar of their faith and die as martyrs, he begins the book by saying, remember, remember who we serve. Remember who owns the church, the kingdom, and remember who's supposed to rule our lives. And ask yourself, who, who has that kind of authority? That kind of authority. And then finally, <clears throat> we've got about three or four minutes left, so let's finish with this tonight. He rules, over, he rules over darkness. He rules over the darkness. Now here are the verses. Verse 14, his head and his hair were white like wool. They were white as snow. And uh, his eyes were like flame of fire. And see, <clears throat> when you got white hair, you got white hair like Jesus. Isn't that a good thing? I feel good about that. You know, the point is that not only does he have authority, but he has moral authority. White, purity, colors mean something in the book of Revelation. And so evil has not touched him. Evil can't influence him. He influences evil. That's the real question of faith, isn't it? The question of faith is, if Jesus is Lord, why is the world still so evil? I think that's a question that every Christian grapples with at some point in time. But the point that's made at the very beginning is that he's not been touched by evil. Jesus is Lord, but the fact is that evil is real, and free will is our challenge. We don't have time to read that tonight. We'll read Revelation 12 along that line another time. The devil can't touch Christ, but he can touch us if we allow it. I want to just notice one other thing in Revelation 1. Did you notice in Revelation 1, in the words that we read, that Jesus is wearing a white robe, it says, and he's wearing a golden sash, and he has a sword. He has a two-edged sword that proceeds out of his mouth. 
But he doesn't have something that Ephesians 6 says Christians have. He doesn't have a shield. Now in Ephesians 6, in our armament, <clears throat> we have the shield of faith, which is the Word of God. But Jesus isn't depicted as having a shield. Why not? And the answer is because he can't be touched by evil. And so from the throne proceeds lightning and thundering and voices. That is, from the throne come power and authority. And when it seems like all hell is broken, broken loose on the earth and ruling the world, that statement that it's from the throne that lightnings and thunders and voices come, that is, God shows who is in control in this world. And it is that way, isn't it? The Revelation says he is the ruler of the kings of the earth, and the firstborn is the highest of the kings of the earth. The Revelation is not promising it's not promising you a life of no struggle if you follow Jesus. I mean, you can still get cancer. You can still lose a job. You can still have a life that has difficulty from your kids. But the fact that God is sovereign doesn't mean, God's sovereign doesn't mean that your life will be tribulation free, but it doesn't mean that it, it does mean that it can be tribulation proof, that you can overcome. You can overcome that. One other thing, I said there were three things, but there are actually four. And let me just mention this in passing. He rules over the grave. And it's interesting that Rome maintained order by threatening your life, right? And so <clears throat> crucifixion was common because it was their way of saying, look, you, I mean, you, you, you give us trouble, and this is what happens. We'll take your life. We'll take it in a painful way. But Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And in verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand on me and he said, don't be afraid. I'm the first and last, look at this, who lives and was dead and I'm alive forevermore. I have the keys of Hades and death. He rules over the grave. There's a lot that can be said about that. Key is going to become very important in the book of Revelation. We're going to read the word keys over and over again because a key has power over a lock, right? A key has power over a lock. And so Jesus is depicted over and over as, as having the keys of whatever it is, that he has the power and the authority over all of that. That's a, that's a good place for us to stop. We'll pick up Wednesday night. I want you to read chapter 2, if you will, for Wednesday night. We'll pick up right there. Thanks for your help.
Good evening. Be singing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. What a friend we have in today. We're glad that you could be with us for our classes tonight. Hope that you have enjoyed and profited from them a great deal. Good to see everybody tonight. If you're visiting with our church family, welcome. Always happy to have visitors with us, and we're always blessed with visitors here. Very grateful for that. We just want to mention a couple of things. There are announcements on the slides. There's no need to repeat what you can read there, and of course matters when the family report this morning. Let me just briefly and quickly say that after our service, at the end of our service this morning, Joshua Joseph was baptized. We're very proud of and happy for Joshua. And of course, Kendall was baptized Wednesday night, and we certainly rejoice with these wonderful young people. We received word today that Betty Williamson passed away, and that's a name that many of our church family would know. Colin and Betty Williamson have been with the Central Church in Ocala for about half a century. Colin preached there for right at 50 years, and uh, he passed away about a year or so ago. And we received word today that Betty had passed away. I know a lot of you know her. A lot of you have visited her business in Ocala and enjoyed that. She was a lovely, gracious, wonderful, wonderful lady. And so we wanted to make you aware of that. We also announced this morning, of course, about Sadie Culp. And Sadie is in her, just celebrated her 96th birthday. But she is, in all probability, in the last several days of her life. And so we want you to please pray. We've been asked to pray that she will simply have a quick, but peaceful exit from this world. I know you'll be glad to do that. And of course, we want to continue to pray that all will go well <clears throat> with uh, the Trimbles and Nerlens and Horns and their new newborn babies, that everything will be just fine with them. And then I just want to say one other thing publicly. I want to say a word to our deacons publicly, if I may. And thank you so very much for the work that you did over the course of the past week as we accommodated crowds last Sunday and then, of course, Wednesday night. There's an awful lot of work that our deacons do in anticipation of Lecture Week. 
not only what Glenn does in organizing the spring cleanup that we always do in advance of that, which is a mountain, a mountain of work that he organizes, but then <clears throat> in preparation for the crowds, there are chairs that have to be staged in various places and all that has to be ready and in place, and then deacons are in place to move those chairs when they need to be added as the, as the crowd grows. And they take care of all of that. And then the logistics of trying to find people's seats uh, in a crowded auditorium. That's a challenge, and they do that so very, very well. And then there is parking, and we hardly know what to say about parking, especially on the Wednesday night of lectures. Uh, I've said the only way to describe it is Carmageddon. I mean, that's, that is what it is out there. But you know what's interesting about that, ladies and gentlemen? For, all the, for the fact that Wednesday night we had people parked four deep, I've never heard a person complain. I've never the next day been on campus and had somebody come up and say, hey, I love your singing, but man, I really hated the parking. I've never had anybody say a single word like that. Because I think what we do inside the building is so much more important than worrying about how we park on the outside. And I'm so thankful we could all be together Wednesday night. What a great night that was. So good to see all of you. Hope you have a wonderful week. Let's stand, sing the song. We'll be dismissed. The honest land of parting. The honest land of parting, losing and leaving, a party on the lost hills, dark and in this and party on the taking and the believing, lies the summer land of bliss and beyond, all so fair and bright and beyond. Pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, the one true God, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, we thank you for blessing us with this day to worship you, to come before your presence in worship, to learn from your word, and to remember your Son and the sacrifice that he was for us. We thank you for your word. Thank you for revealing us through your word, your love for us, and especially the plan of salvation through your Son. We especially thank you today for Joshua, who answered the gospel call and put on Christ in baptism. What an encouragement it is to all of us here, Lord, to see him answering the call in your word. Lord, we thank you especially for all the young people in this congregation as they all strive to serve you and obey your word. And we thank you for our older members in this congregation for the example that they are to us, for the wisdom that they share for us. And we thank you for all the young families we have here in this congregation as they work hard to bring up children to love and serve you. We thank you for all the little ones that have been born recently and adopted, and we pray that you'll be with all the expecting mothers, that your hand of protection will be upon them. Lord, we especially pray this evening that you'll be with Sandy Culp and her family, that she will pass, peace, pass peacefully from this world to be with you, and that her family will be comforted. And we also pray that you'll be with the family of Betty Williamson as they mourn her passing. Lord, we thank you for this life that you've given us. We pray that we'll use it to serve you, to bring glory and honor to you, and that people this week will see that we serve you, that you are our God, and that we love you, and that you love us, that we'll be lights to this world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.